So I'm going to start off this speed dating with a case of a incredibly young, vivacious um, traveler um, who um, recently traveled to Victoria Falls. Um, and you can see that, and she's on the line, in fact, we, we have our case with us um, and welcome. Um, despite this severe, clearly severe, um, stressful event, she um, survived it, thankfully. And um, before she jumped off, she decided to take uh, anti-malarial prophylaxis because this is the Victoria Falls and she was going into a malarial area. And she decided to take um, a tovaquone progradal, which we know as malonil, um, sometimes known as malarone uh, abroad. And it's one of the three main options for chemoprophylaxis for malaria, uh, along with mefloquine um, and uh, doxycycline. Uh, she decided to go for a tovaquone progradal, and she managed to take it. And then when she came back, um, about day one and day two, uh, the patient who can tell us how she felt um, at some stage uh, felt very nauseated and um, was uh, presented to a doctor who, um, an ID specialist, asking whether she could stop her antimalarials. Um, and the doctor said yes. Why did the doctor say yes? So, as you know, uh, the tovacoin proguanil prophylaxis is, is um, the manufacturer's instructions suggest um, that, sorry, uh, the, the manufacturer's suggestion is that uh, it's one day before uh, entry into the malaria area and seven days, obviously duration through uh, every day and then seven days afterwards. So is there um, any evidence that uh, a tovacoin progranol could be given as a shorter course. Well, the first piece of um, data actually comes from 1946 um, from uh, studies of what was then called paludrin, which is uh, the prophylactic has uh, progranol um, in it. And um, there was evidence that single dose of progranol um, given uh, day, to volunteers uh, two to days after a uh, falciparum um, infection uh, challenge was protective. Um, so as post-exposure prophylaxis, uh, uh, the pro pro progranol was, was uh, an option. Um, then there was a study um, of a tovaquone, um, the tovaquone component in 1999, um, and this was a study where uh, there were three groups. Um, patients either received um, seven daily doses of a tovaquone uh, starting the day before challenge, which is as one would generally. Um, six received a single dose um, of 250 milligrams of a tovaquone the day before challenge, and four received none. Uh, and so that is placebo. And the four that received none all got parasitemia but those that had the uh, atovaquone, just a single dose, in fact, um, did not get uh, malaria. And then also um, it was shown in a human challenge model um, that a single dose of atovaquone proguanil, this is in 30 volunteer challenge, and there were various arms, including um, those given one day prior, those given seven days prior at different doses. Uh, and there was a matching placebo for each. So they all took the same number of tablets. And then they gave a, a sporozoic, sporozoic mosquito challenge uh, with falciparum. And those that um, the infectivity controls all got parasitemia. Um, and although at very low dose, those given seven days prior, um, they got two of them got malaria. Um, the all volunteers um, in the Atovaquone arms were protected. So a single dose atovaquone progranol provided effective malaria keeper prophylaxis, um, which would support an, a, a weekly dosing. So but what about in real life settings? Um, so there are two studies. One um, was undertaken in uh, Israeli travelers, and they looked at uh, nearly 500 travelers 
who had been to sub-Saharan Africa. Um, the cumulative exposure was, was long, in 5,000 days. And um, of the 421 who discontinued prophylaxis a day after leaving the, the um, endemic region, none of the malaria, none, none had malaria. The other study was in West Africa in long-term travelers who were there for greater than six months who just refused to take um, prophylaxis as it was uh, as it was advised by the manufacturers and a group both one group in Luanda or in, in Angola and one group in Equatorial Guinea um, combined to provide this data sorry I don't know why it's moving about and provide this data where there was a group of 33 people who just took malarone twice weekly which seemed acceptable to them those that took uh, mefloquine um, once weekly and then no prophylaxis and in the patients in the people taking twice weekly malarone um, there were no malaria cases on follow-up of a total of 391 months at risk so everything points basically to the fact that um, malonil can be used in prophylaxis either as a, a once um, a, a, a normal once before and then probably uh, twice a week and then one one day after you come back and then stop um, or even potentially once weekly and then one one day um, after you come back and without evidence of malaria um, being a major issue okay so that um, that was the um, that was the case and I'd like to thank our the recipient or the subject of the case for joining us today. Um, Ms. Mita, are you, um, uh, I know it's obviously breaking conf patient confidentiality, but is there anything you'd like to add? No, no. I'm going to sue you because, no, no, <laughs> it was fine. I only took it for two days after and I've been fine, but it's really, it's really, is really strange because it's the second time I've had this severe, severe nausea side effect with anti-malarials. Um, I, I just couldn't, I didn't eat anything for 48 hours. It was that bad, which is why I stopped. Um, and it was also nausea during sleep. Even in your sleep, you feel nauseous. It was bizarre. And I'm a pharmacist. So I should know about these side effects. Um, but yeah, I, I stopped it and I haven't had any malaria symptoms yet. So I think going forward, I will take a shorter course. Well, we would always advise you, of course, if you do that get, become unwell, that you have a malaria test. Yeah. Um, and apparently your lawyers are going to be in touch okay <laughs> any comments from colleagues um, if we can raise hands everyone happy now you can go off and have take less malonil the problem of course with malonil is how expensive it is at 50 rand a shot one per dose um certainly going forward i'm only in fact previously i've only been taking one dose on return um and not uh, for seven days but it's up to you. Okay, um, Sipo. Well, I was just going to ask you, um, because you've looked at these different regimes, um, which one would you prefer um, suggest? Uh, because there's a twice weekly, then there's the one, you know, the day before you leave, while you're there, and then stopping one day after return. Um, which one do you favor, just given the literature you've looked at? So there haven't, obviously there hasn't been a trial of combining the twice weekly and one day after you return. Um, but I'm very happy to go with um, twice weekly and um, uh, twice weekly and uh, uh, once after um, once after uh, you return. The, the half life of both the tovacrone and, and progranol is extremely long, you know, in the sort of around 50 plus hours. Um, so I'm quite confident that I would um, go with a, a shortened regimen. But if you're going to take the one day before and during, then definitely I'd say one day, uh, just one once on the day after you return. Okay, um, we're going back to screen share and uh, we're going to welcome Astrid, who's going to um, give her clinical case. Hi. Just say next slide when you want it. 
Okay, perfect. Well, I'm Astrid Christensen uh, from Argentina. I'm in the residence of infectious diseases at Muniz Hospital in, in Buenos Aires. Next. Well, I'm going to talk about a, a patient. Uh, he was admitted uh, the 3rd of March in my hospital. He is 59 years old, was born in Kitilipi, that is uh, one of uh, a little rural area in the north of the country. The name of the province is, is Chaco. He is HIV positive since 2012 with known history of RIVs and any treatment. And in the moment he was admitted, the CD4 and the viral load was, uh, were unknown. And the clinical manifestations were headache. The next, please. Oh, I don't know what happened. Here, it's okay. Well, uh, he was admitted with headaches, cognitive disorders, and deterioration of the general condition. In the laboratory, he had a pancytopenia, and well, this one is the, the CT brain at the moment he was admitted. Next. Well, uh, the radiologist reported uh, an area of uh, hypodensity around the lateral ventricle, but the uh, magnetic resonance is pending. The, um, well, the, the CT brain, the CT chest are, are clean. Next. Um, in the CSF, uh, he had low glucose. The proteins were uh, high, three grams per liter and 23 cells, 100% of lymphocytes. Next. Well, the microbiologist um, was, when examining the, the sample, he, he looked at a parasite moving inside the, the CSF. Next. And here, well, he reported the, the parasite as Trypanosoma cruzi. Next. Well, later we had the other results of the patient with a CD4 count of 21 cells, 6%. The viral load was, was high, more than 100,000. The cyphilis serology, the treponemal test was positive, but the no treponemal test negative. The hepatitis was negative, the toxoplasmosis EGG was negative, and the Chagas EGG was positive. And in the CSF, the gene expert, the neurovirus, and the culture was negative. That's why the diagnostic was um, Chagasic um, meningoencephalitis. And well, he began the treatment with Ben's Nidasol. Um, four days later, the the doctors decided to begin the ARBs because we don't have consistent evidence contraindicating the, the initiation of, of the HIV treatment and, and a potential risk of, or an iris. And a new lumbar function was uh, performed uh, four days uh, after treatment and the cells and the proteins were better. Next. Well, I'm, I'm going to, to talk a little about the Chagas Massa disease or American trypanosomiasis. Chagas and Massa were the, the main doctors on researches of this disease. Chagas from Brazil and Massa from Argentina. There are more than 8 million people affected worldwide with 28,000 new cases per year. Uh, transmitted by vector and 8,000 in the vertical transmission with more than 12,000 deaths per year and is endemic in 21 countries in Latin America is one of the neglected diseases in the um, in the list of the World Health Organization. In Argentina, we have more than a million people living with, with Chagas disease and 4% of 
them are co-infected with HRV. The etiological agent is the parasite Trypanosoma cruzi. The vector is an hematophagous uh, insect called Triatoma infestans, but well, everybody knows it as Vintuca, is the, the nickname in Argentina. And the route of transmission is vectorial. Uh, that is very important in the north of the country because of the, of the constructions of the houses. The transplacental transmission is uh, an important problem in all the country with a transmission rate between 0.5 and 10%. And other routes of transmission are the transfusion, the organ transplantation, intravenous drug users, laboratory or surgical accidents, and the digestive route that is more popular in Brazil because they used to drink um, some natural juices that could be contaminated with the, with the parasite. Uh, next. Well, that is the, the, the north of the country with, with more risk. And next. Well, it's the, the, the buildings that the Bintuka can live in the, in the world. The next, well, that is the, the cycle of the parasite. When the Bintuca bites, the poseid uh, feces with the tripomastigotes that enter um, bite wound or mucosal membranes and travel through the, through the blood. And it has a special predilection for the cardiac cells. Next. Well, um, we have to differentiate the uh, acute um, manifestations or reactivation of the disease and the chronic disease that is so different. In the acute reactivation, the parasitemia is positive. More than 90% of the patients are asymptomatic and the, pa the patients who, who have symptoms are non-specific like fever, hepatosplenomegaly, adenopathies and the most serious manifestations are myocarditis and meningual cephalitis. Less than 5% of the patients have specific symptoms, like the inoculation chagoma, is the inflammation in the place that the Vintuca bites. And if, it's, if it is close to the eyes, we can see the Romania sign that is very specific of Chagas. Uh, and well, the, the diagnostic is with the direct observation of the parasite in blood or CSF. We can see the tripomastigotes or the amastigotes in the biopsy. And we, can, we must treat all these patients. Well, uh, next, we have a, a lot of animation, sorry, in the, in the PowerPoint, but uh, I continue speaking about the chronic uh, disease. Only 30% of the patients um, in a period of time of 10 or 20 years after the infection, or one less. <laughs> the previous, sorry, thank you. Um, well, only 30% of the patient 10 or 20 years after the infection have problems with the megaviscerous. The more frequent uh, is the cardiomyopathy with arrhythmias that the more important is the right bundle branch block. Um, the people who have the, the digestive uh, disease with megacolon and megaesophagus, and the diagnostic is uh, with the serology that ELISA and immunofluorescence are the more sensitive test, but we can also do a, a PCR and the treatment is controversial. Next. Well, in, in this picture, we can see the thick smear. That is one of the most popular tests uh, in the acute uh, manifestation in the, uh, the disease. And we can see the Drypanosoma cruzi through the microscope. Next. Well, um, I, I want to speak a little about the reactivation in immunosuppressed hosts because in HIV patients, it's the, the most uh, presentation is the meningoencephalitis or chagoma. Chagoma is one of the, in, in Argentina, in Latin America, is one of the, the 
differential diagnostic uh, when we have a city brain with a space occupying lesion. Um, and it's very, very important because the, mor the mortality rate is between 80 and 100% without treatment. And well, this is a, a review that was done in my hospital. Uh, between these years, 15 patients had uh, tagoma, and only two of the CT brains uh, were, were normal. And well, other manifestations can be myocarditis and paniculitis. And for the treatment, we have only two drugs available that are benzidazole or nifortimox, that are all drugs and have a lot of potential uh, toxicities. The treatment is for 60 days, but if the patient have a severe toxicities, we can stop at day 30. Uh, the next, well, we, we always have to treat the acute disease or the reactivation. Uh, you, uh, people younger than 19 years old, young women that have the possibility to be pregnant, laboratory or surgical accident, uh, organ donor positives when the transplant is not an emergency, and we never have to treat during pregnancy, pregnancy because the, of the toxicity of the drugs. Uh, people with severe kidney or hepatic insufficiency and severe neurological disorders. And the last one, that is the, the potential toxicities of the, of the drugs. Both of them have problems with uh, digestive tube and uh, liver toxicity. The problem with the nifortimox is the potential toxicity in the central nervous system. And with benzidazole, uh, the problems in the skin, the blood, and peripheral neuropathy. And well, nothing else, thanks and the bibliography if you want to, to read about it. Lovely, fantastic. Um, Astrid, thank you very much. Um, it's, always great to, it's always great to hear about, um, about diseases that we see very, very rarely. In fact, I don't think outside of the hospital of tropical diseases, I saw a case once that I've ever seen it, but um, what, why is it, what does Vinchuka mean? Well, Vinchuka is like the nickname of the triatoma infestans in Argentina. But what does but, it mean? Uh, oh, I don't know if it have a, um, no, no, I don't know. Because no. we call it, I mean, there's various other nicknames for, in English. I mean, the assassin bug is one of them. Yeah. Um, and the kissing bug is another, but... Okay, and why do we know why it likes the eyes? Because the Romana sign is not uncommon. Why does it? What is it about the eye that it likes to that it likes to land near? Do we know? It, to the iris, sorry. No, because Romana's sign is where is when you have the triatoma infecting, excoriating the skin close to the eye. Ah, yes. Why does yes. it always go for the eye? Well, it's um, the the Vintuka live in, in in the house, those houses that I, I showed the, the picture, and it's very common that they uh, bite during night. And well, the, the kids uh, usually are in the bed, and well, the, the face or the limbs are outside the the bed sheets. And that's why it's very common that that you have in the in the face. Fantastic, um, and it was a beautiful video of the uh, tripomastigote in the in the CSS. Thank you. Um, I don't see any um, any hands up, so I think everyone's shocked and um, and as it's speed dating, fallen in love with your case. So uh, I think <laughs> it's probably going to win, um, and I'm sure there are a few matches. So we're going to move uh, on. I was I was waiting for three years in Muniz Hospital a case like like this one. And the patient appeared in my first week in South Africa. Uh, that's why all my colleagues no. and, and you missed out. Okay, Elizabeth, yeah. you've got your hand up. Elizabeth? Yeah, I, I just wanted to say um, apparently Charles Darwin died of Chagas disease from mega esophagus. Mm. 
Okay, interesting. It's also interesting that we never hear Maza. You always hear Chagas disease, but you don't hear Maza's yeah. name very much. And of course, being yeah. it should be Maza. Anyway, well, it is it's like a, a, a little proud in Argentina because one of the, of the main doctors and researchers in, in Argentina, and the, he worked a lot in the north of the country. Yeah. But in Argentina, the, the most frequent, the more frequent presentation is the cardiac. Uh, a, a chronic disease in the heart, no, not Fantastic. the omega colonies in Brazil. Okay. Lovely, it, very interesting. We can talk more about it offline. But thanks very much indeed. We're going to go to our next um, presenter, who um, you sort of, as you, as you have guessed, is um, is the one and only, or the only, <laughs> uh, Prof. Papa Van Aris. Harry, over to you. Um, thanks, Prof. Um, I didn't put that as uh, my uh, opening slide, but okay, thank you for placing it in there. So I'm going to in introduce you to an interesting gentleman we actually currently have um, in the wards that I'd seen last year. So it's a 31-year-old. He's HIV negative. He's got a CD4 count of 106, and he's got these multiple opportunistic infections, and that was last year when we first met him. He had uh, non typhi salmonella, and he had this sister, Isospora uh, belly and uh, enteritis, as, as well as PTB. The PTB was uh, initially diagnosed in 2016 and then again in 2020. Um, and now he presents um, back to Kruliskia Hospital, actually to one of the clinics, which we'll get to a little bit later, with um, uh, a, a, again. Um, an enteritis with uh, an acute kidney injury with a creatinine of around 300 and the stool MCNS um, over in parasites came back with Giardia lamblia. And interestingly, he's also grown in methicillin sensitive Staph aureus as well as uh, we're busy working it up for, for Haemophilus influenza bloodstream infection. Next, please. Um, so the differential diagnosis, um, one needs to, to look into what are the causes of this patient. I mean, we usually see this with our HIV positive patients and HIV is definitely going to be on the cards, but hang on, he's HIV negative. And that was actually on multiple occasions. He wasn't a heavy ethanol user. And then I like the term called failures. Um, so is there pancreatic failure? So diabetics, um, is there a renal failure, hepatic failure um, that predisposed patients to infection? And in his case, none of those were present. Next, please. And then, well, one's got to consider primary immune deficiencies. Next, please. And in this case, he actually present he actually has um, combined uh, variable immune def uh, immune deficiency. And uh, this is a nice uh, representation of um, what is found in CVID. And now, variable means that it's just the various manifestations that they present with. So, if um, if you look at the top of the screen, you can get they can present with rhinosinusitis, um, otitis media with lots of otitis externa as well, um, a lot of autoimmune diseases. So you, one needs to keep monitoring them for the development of that. And then bronchiectasis is also a complication um, of, of these patients because of these multiple respiratory tract infections that they develop. But interestingly, they also get enteropathies and they get villus atrophy. And um, it's similar to what is seen in celiac disease. And um, they also present with other autoimmune hemolytic anemias and thrombocytopenias. And one needs to then say to yourself, well, is this in keeping? If you see these patients that present with these various infections that are HIV negative, you need to ask yourself, well, is it this um, CVID? And in, in this case, you have to look at the criteria. It is the most, one of the most common, I think it is actually the most common uh, primary immune deficiency. Um, and one needs to look for hypogamic globinemia with an uh, IgG, IgG um, two standard deviations below the mean with either IgA or IgM deficiency and then poor absent responses to vaccines. And what I mean by that is patient comes in, you'll do their, their titers, you'll do their tetanus, their diphtheria, their, uh, strip, uh, their um, uh, streptococcus pneumonia titers. And then what happens is you'll see they're very low. And then what you do is... Um, 
um, you then um, do, sorry, uh, you then check the titers and, and give them a vaccine. And then if the vaccine goes up, and the titers go up, then you suspect that it's most likely, um, it's not most likely a primary immune deficiency, but it's probably in keeping with uh, the CVID. Um, and then you have to exclude that there aren't any other immune uh, de defects present. And um, one also needs to ensure that the patient's more than two years of age. Now, the management is, is rather interesting. And this is what's been happening with this gentleman is that he presents on a monthly basis to the hematologists at our clinic. And he gets monthly IVIG. Um, and the dose of the IVIG will also depend on the state of the patient and what um, disease processes they have. And interestingly enough, in patients that have enteropathies, you actually need to give a higher IVIG. Now, immunizations, um, you're going to do IVIG. Uh, sorry, IVIG actually does cover those organisms, the t uh, tetanus, diphtheria, pneumococcus. Um, but what's interesting is because CVID is associated with a B cell dysfunction, um, you still have cell mediated in, um, immunity. So what that means is that even if you give the patients immunizations, the tetanus, the and pneumococcus, they actually will, they should have some protection from it uh, because of the T cell, um, uh, t because of the T cells that will be um, produced. Now, the other thing is bronchiectasis is very difficult to manage and these patients generally do need uh, pulmonology input, physiotherapy, et cetera, et cetera. And because they develop enteropathies, um, uh, you have to look out for the fat soluble vitamins and consider replacement. And hence in this gentleman, we've asked for vitamin D levels as well as uh, checking iron off for vitamin K. And then in very rare circumstances, from what I could understand from this article is that patients that, um, that may benefit from a, hemo, uh, from a stem, stem cell transplant or those ones that have um, hematological malignancies. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. That's that's my case. Thanks very much, Terry. Very nice, and uh, um, real apologies for um, the, the the switching around of slides. Um, I don't know what's happening to this uh, program today, no, but it, it is. Um, that was very interesting. I don't know if anybody has any questions. I mean, things fairly um, very very well uh, elucidated. I mean, Terry, what's the median age that that these um, people with with the combined immunodeficiency start to present with um, with infections? Mm -hmm. So it's quite variable because uh, a lot of them are missed, but um, it can be anywhere from ch childhood until adulthood. And actually in this gentleman's case, he was only diagnosed at age uh, 30, which was last year. Okay, thanks. Sean has a question. Thanks, Terry. Uh, nice case. We don't see it or think about it often. Um, I just had a question about the acronym and then uh, a related question. I always thought that the C stood for combined, not common. And the reason why I'm asking that is, is there really no uh, components of cellular immune defect? And um, like the clinical presentation of this patient would suggest that there is. I mean, he had a low CD4 count and he got recurrent isosporiasis. Um, which, uh, you know, we, we see in people with advanced HIV because of cellular immune defects. And so how do you explain that if that isn't a component? Yeah, I'd, I'd have to go back. Um, but on your question about combined, I've also read combined immune, variable immune deficiency, but I was looking on uh, up to date the other day and they were actually saying that it's also called com common variable immune deficiency. Um, so maybe there's two terms for out. I'd need to look back and see which is the better term to use. Um, with regards to the cellular immunity, I mean, like you say, for this patient, it does make sense that he does have some cell mediated immunity. Um, but I think in general, this is seen as more of a B cell, uh, defect. Um, and hence in the criteria when you, it, it's one of the, 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 the first criteria there is, is the patient must have IgG, um, deficiency. Um, I'd, I'd need to go read a bit more about the cell mediated immunity issues that they develop. Okay, thanks very much. Um, so I, I'm not sure, again, I, um, I can't see, Sean, is that an old hand now? Um, I can't see any further hands up. So we're going to go to our, our next case, two more left, um, and wonderful cases they, they are. Um, so welcome 
to the screen, um, Alicia. Uh, just going to the, trying to get to the next slide. Super, okay, Alicia, over to you. Uh, good, uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Alicia Pichan. I'm a cardiologist in the Department of Medicine at Fortis Gear, which is an affiliate of the University of Cape Town, currently rotating in the Department of uh, Infectious Diseases. I chose this topic because of its many, uh, many facets in terms of clinical presentation, which is the many varied uh, presentations of leptospirosis. So opening my case with a case uh, presentation of a gentleman who was seen uh, by a colleague in the department about a month ago. So he is a 20, he was, he was uh, because he is no more. So he sadly demised about a month ago. So he was a 27 years old male patient, HIV negative, no known comorbidities. Uh, DRC national living in South Africa for the past three years with no recent travel history. He worked as a car guard, he lived in a shack which he shared with more than five people, so it was a little bit crowded. When then uh, there was a history that it was heavily infested with rats. Uh, he presented at Mitchell Spain Hospital, which is a peripheral hospital in Cape Town, with a three week history of a febrile illness associated GI symptoms of nausea and vomiting, a deep jaundice. There was also a mention of a history of using some concoction of over-the-counter medication, which the, the, the friends had bought, uh, bought for him, but they could not tell what, what those were. Um, this at, um, at Mitchell's plane uh, in the department of EC on his arrival. So this, I've just taken only the blood test of the first, so the first column. So there is a date there of the 21st, unfortunately, I don't see it now. So and then the first and the last column, uh, this is the first and then in the 25th, it was the last day, which is certainly the day he demised. So um, they highlighted, and I think the highlighted figures uh, the, um, for the blood count is to look at the white cell count, which was marginally low. And then by the end, which is about four days later, it had reduced it quite markedly to 1.84. Uh, similarly with the hemoglobin, it was 7.7 .7, and then it was um, going down. Platelets, they were hovering, but very low. Uh, there was coagulopathy, so of 1.79. So in between the two dates, there was also another INR which had gone up, uh, which was even more, it was 1.89. Um, of, of importance, this patient presented with acute kidney injury. So the presenting um, urea creatinine on the first day of admission was 47.7. And then on the last day, it was 73 uh, of urea and creatinine 718. He did not receive dialysis during this time. He was passing urine, uh, but there is no quantifiable volumes of how much he was passing. Um, there was also no baseline, so because the patient had been fairly well up, and, up until this presentation. Um, also, he had this deep jaundice with a bilis of 816 uh, on the first day of admission, uh, which did not differ much. Uh, five days later, they were still hovering at about 767 with the bilis of um, the conjugated below 508 and 767. And then if you go down the slide, Prof, um, no, um, no, on the same one. Uh, Okay, yeah. oh, okay, sorry, it is not, okay. So the, there wasn't much uh, in terms of the transaminitis, just marginal elevation of transaminitis with only canalcula enzyme elevation, also not that significant. You can move to the next. So in the summary of positive findings that um, I just gathered together on this slide. So this is a young man who is HIV negative with no comorbidities, who lives in a shack, heavily infested with rats, overcrowded uh, with uh, sharing it with more than five people. 
in the shack, which is an informal settlement uh, in South Africa. So with a febrile illness, three week duration, deeply jaundice, marked hyperbilirubinia, pancytopenia with coagulopathy, um, severe acute kidney injury, even though he was passing urine, but it was noted by the attending doctor that it was called Tofekala Madi Brown. Uh, he had an ultrasound. Um, So a little bit backward, yeah. He had an ultrasound which showed splenomegaly and the liver, there was no hepatomegaly but steatosis. Of, of, also to mention there was cholecystitis with gold stones on the abdominal ultrasound. So the differentials uh, uh, that we can uh, derive like from this uh, patient uh, are those recursive typhi which also is um, it is zoonotic at illness, so trans, uh, which is uh, it is in the rats, so which this patient also was uh, was in contact with rats, uh, malaria, which is a multi-system disease, but uh, against it, the patient had not traveled in the in the three years since he he arrived in South Africa, a uh, Lassa fever, so which is also a multi-system. Sorry, which is also a multi-system disease. Um, sorry, and leptospirosis. Um, leptospirosis because also it is a it is a multi-system disease. He was deeply jaundiced. He had acute kidney injury. Uh, he was febrile, a dengue fever, which also has got almost the same uh, presentation. So the others, um, Hunter virus and hemophagocytic syndrome, which is a rare manifestation of a leptospirosis. So I looked at the two articles which uh, support the atypical manifestations of leptospirosis. So this first one, it is a review article that was published in 2015. So by the University of Colombo and the, by the Department of Parasitology, so in Sri Lanka. So the article, what, uh, was important, what is important out of this article, so the most important, uh, the most common uh, clinical manifestations of a typical presentation of lecture. So those are, are those that are involving the brain. So the cardiovascular and the respiratory. With the brain, meningitis is the commonest. It is often aseptic, but in the prevalence, it is not yet established because uh, most of these patients, they present with thrombocyto thrombocytopenia. And often at times clinicians um, are very discouraged um, to, to do uh, lumbar punctures on those patients. So they present with this mind, like headache um, with uh, neck stiffness. Uh, another neurological manifestation of uh, leptospirosis, it will be that of acute disseminated encephalomyelitis, which is an acronym ADEM, so which uh, patients present with confusion. And uh, uh, they are uh, reported case studies uh, where then these patients, they, they will have symptoms of confusion during convalescing around about uh, 10 days into treatment. So they, then this is something also to think about. Hydrocephalus is also one of the atypical presentations of a neurological manifestation of leptospirosis. But what is interesting about this, then it would not uh, be associated with meningitis. It will occur alone. So on the cardiac manifestations, myocarditis, it is the most common. It is often very fatal. And then uh, arrhythmias are also um, very common. And then uh, the most common ones will be sinus tachycardia, your atrial fibrillations, and the dynamic T-wave changes. So on the reported case studies, there was a reported case studies which they did on, uh, monitored over 22 patients. So out of the 22 patients, about 13 of them, they had ECG abnormalities during the, during the febrile phase of, the, of acute leptospirosis. And then the latter, which are about nine, so they were, they, they were shown to, to they, they exhibited the echo 
abnormalities such as mild uh, forms of mitral regurgitation and aortic regurgitation. But then these were, they were not sure as to whether this was uh, caused by the metabolic derangement or if there was some primary pre-existing myocardial insult. With the respiratory uh, uh, manifestations, what is common there is your diffuse alveolar hemorrhages, which are often very fatal. There can be also ARDS, which is secondary to, to, to the sepsis. And then there also will be then the hemophysicocytotic syndrome. So in conclusion, uh, leptospirosis is an illness with quite a perplexing array of clinical manifestations which can potentially outsmart even the smartest clinicians. So being aware of these rare manifestations of the disease will enable early recognition, timely institution of treatment and uh, improved patient survival. Okay, thanks very much indeed, Alicia. A very nice um, overview of the more um, unusual manifestations of leptospirosis. Um, we didn't sort of get to the the reasoning behind the incredibly high bilirubins, which is a, you know, is a, is a transport defect. But um, Sipo, I mean, this is your favorite disease. Uh, any quick comments before you present your case? Because time is, is running on. No, 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 thanks, Mark. And uh, yeah, look, I think it's always important to know that uh, electrospirosis can present unusually. And I think um, we were debating with this particular case as a young man about whether this was an unusual manifestation of leptospirosis. Unfortunately, we don't have a, a, a PM, but um, the, you know, I think it's, it's, it's just uh, a reminder to people given also the, I think we're coming to leptospirosis in, in, in our city uh, with the rain and uh, 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 just for people to be aware of it. I think already I've seen one or two uh, this month of, of what looks like uh, severe forms of, 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 of leptospirosis. Yeah, so Thanks. an interesting disease and very work, one which we struggle to make a diagnosis given that we don't have the proper diagnostic. Indeed, no, thank Serology you. is not helpful, yeah. So, um, Di, the um, Wolfgang Preiser looked for hantaviruses um, at length in, uh, in small mammals and rodents. Um, recently. Any thoughts on whether we should, in the leptospira negative cases, we had one recently who died who had a negative leptospirosis. Any, um, any worth, is it worthwhile looking for hantaviruses or not? I think we should be. I think we tried a couple of years and then we gave up, but I think we should, we should, we should be. And our virologists, any, um, any thoughts on that, Diana or um, Ruan? Silence. Okay. Um, Sipo, you are actually on. Oh, thank you very I much. I'm just going to say something and then I'll start. Okay. So I'm really having trouble here with this, piece, um, this screen today. Um, okay. Sipo, over to you. All right, so uh, mine is who's fooling who. So fool me once, but you won't fool me twice. Um, uh, so um, this is a case uh, I just came across, um, which is a 61, they describe a 61 year old um, uh, female who uh, lives in rural USA and essentially uh, on presentation was, been, was ill for about four weeks uh, with dyspnea, uh, dry cough palpitations and uh, chest tightness. Uh, in the month preceding her, her visit, um, she had seen her rural uh, uh, primary care physician who thought she probably had a pneumonia and he gave her uh, a course of antibiotics and with that he also gave her some steroids, but that really didn't uh, alleviate uh, her symptoms. Um, just on her presentation when she was uh, uh, reviewed, uh, further questioning didn't uh, reveal any history of either night sweats, uh, chills, uh, or barrier or any arthralgia uh, and uh, a, no, uh, a no weight uh, uh, problem. What was interesting was that she reported that uh, four years earlier, she had similar symptoms as the current symptoms and um, was found to have uh, uh, some 
degenerative mitral valve disease, which required repair, and this was done. Uh, on and that um, might uh, uh, and, and and that uh, surgery, some uh, histology was sent was sent off, and the histology basically showed uh, some calcification of the valve with some uh, fibr uh, fibrosis and. Uh, evidence of mild and uh, uh, and acute uh, chronic inflammation. Of interest at the time, the report said that she had uh, showed rare neutrophils, but there were no organisms. At the time, she didn't see an ID specialist uh, uh, because the thought was that she didn't have um, an infection and um, no other further tests were done. And I think the picture you see there is just uh, what the mitral valve uh, looked like at repair. Uh, and uh, she did well. Um, next slide. So her physical examination essentially at this point uh, uh, demonstrates somebody who's in heart failure. Uh, she gets an echo, which is a transthoracic echo, which uh, demonstrates um, aortic regurgitation and also severe mitral regurgitation and what looks like also a vegetation on her aortic valve. She gets blood done, which essentially uh, don't demonstrate any elevation in the white cell count, and certainly the ERCT, so ESR and CRP were, were normal. Um, uh, blood cultures are done, and, uh, and three sets, uh, together with uh, cultures for fungi and mycobacteria. She also is then um, has an echo because they want uh, transfer for dual echo, sorry, because they want to just have a better look at her, her aortic valve just to see uh, to better understand the vegetation. She in in addition, uh, serological tests are done for uh, uh, chlamydia, Bartonella, Brucella, and all of those are negative, and uh, PCRs for Legionella and Triforium. Uh, um, Whipley as well, and those are, are, are negative. She is um, started on a course of broad spectrum antibiotics. They don't tell us what, but uh, she's put on antibiotics and um, is cleared up for surgery. Next. Um, so she has a valve surgery, um, and, uh, um, and what happens is that they take out the mitral and the aortic valves, and uh, those are replaced with mechanical valves. And the histological uh, examination basically shows evidence of uh, uh, chronic and acute inflammation on, on both valves. Uh, in, and importantly, um, you know, um, um, the cultures of that uh, uh, at, at, at this stage don't uh, uh, show anything. Um, what I'm just showing you in this uh, particular uh, uh, slide is just the tissue uh, histology, which shows um, pairs positive uh, 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 macrophages with um, what looks like uh, um, um, uh, positive um, uh, curvilinear organisms in it. So um, <clears throat> uh, a PCR is then done, and the next slide um, uh, demonstrates the organism. So what this lady has is a Triforium uh, Whipley endocarditis. And essentially, this is a gram positive bacillus, um, common in nature, but a rare cause of endocarditis, uh, and um, often uh, can cause uh, uh, what is uh, culture negative uh, uh, endocarditis. And um, the, the literature shows a number of case reports, and, uh, uh, but uh, one thing in particular is, is noticed is that it's often a very difficult diagnosis to make, often uh, because of uh, just demonstrating the, the, the organism may be quite difficult, uh, both serologically and sometimes even on tissue. Um, what's also interesting is that these patients often don't have the classical sort of uh, uh, presentations of endocarditis uh, that other patients may have. So even if you look at um, the presence of vegetation uh, compared to other culture negative endocarditis, these patients would have probably about uh, uh, two thirds of them would have a vegetation. So not all of them would, would have a vegetation. And the other thing to, to, to note is that they are often afibrile, so they won't necessarily have a fever. 
uh, and um, so sometimes this is often a, a chance uh, 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 di diagnosis uh, to, 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 to make. Um, what's important, I think, is probably also recognizing that they may not have the classical symptoms of uh, uh, Wuttle's uh, disease, so that people are, are, are familiar with, with the GIT um, uh, uh, symptoms. Often, if any symptom they will have, they may have just nostalgia as well. In terms of treatment, um, uh, it, there's a induction and then obviously maintenance, and that induction is usually sort of four weeks of antibiotics, uh, and then uh, the maintenance would include uh, uh, up to about a year, so 12 months, and uh, typically would be uh, uh, coltramoxazole would be the the the, the typical uh, antimicrobial to use. So that's uh, sweet and short from me. Uh, I think um, it's like just a question for our micro team whether we should be looking for this uh, organism. Are we missing it? Uh, is it fooling us? Thanks, Ipo. Very nice case. Um, so, micro. Elizabeth, Hafsa, Amanda, what do you think? You put me on missing this organism. Um, I think it's quite difficult to diagnose from the micro point of view, um, but we probably are, are, I'd agree with SIPO that we are probably missing quite a few cases. Super, so what are you gonna do about it? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'll have to investigate. Is there a PCR that um, we should be doing or serology? Um, if, if anything, then let's just say that often uh, that you, your best bet is uh, PCR of the tissue. Uh, serology can 